although uh, I'm the one uh, speaking here today, it involves a large number of graduate students, of uh, collaborators from places like CSIRO, and uh, yeah, I'll get straight into it as soon as I work out how this works. <laughs> okay. There's a massive international fishery trade in sharks. Now that trade is largely after shark fin. Predominantly the product people want is shark fin. It's estimated there's anywhere between seven, 75 to 200 million sharks a year caught and that, and that catch is largely unregulated and very poorly recorded. And that's why there's such a variance in that estimate of how many sharks are being caught. It's a very fast growing fishery. Shark fin is a very valuable commodity. And it's uh, in Hong Kong, the markets in Hong Kong account for 50% of the world's uh, um, market. And like I said, it's mostly going into shark fin soup. And here we have a person standing outside of walking past a, a, a shop in Hong Kong that specializes in selling shark fin. Now, as uh, Janice and, um, and Malcolm pointed out earlier today, if we're going to understand the present and we're going to predict something about the future, we need to know something about the past. And when it comes to sharks, we need to know something about human past. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a history lesson. And that history lesson takes place in China with the Kangxi Emperor, a very, very powerful and famous man one of the first emperors to unite China into, from a group of warring states into an empire. Um, he ruled the dynasty for 61 years, an incredible length of time um, considering the circumstances. And he was a brilliant man. He compiled a calendar. He, in, he invented a calendar, rather, and he compiled a dictionary. He went round China. He sent scribes all around China to record, rather like the Brothers Grimm, um, fairy stories, and in fact, Cinderella comes from uh, some of the stories he recorded. Anyway, he was, he was not just a smart bloke, he also enjoyed a great party. He was famous for banquets. He had spectacular, huge banquets on a scale that today are, are barely uh, comprehensible. But he was also a man, you know, he really liked laws, and he codified the rituals uh, for these banquets. Now, Sharkman had been a popular um, dish in China for, for thousands of years, but he laid down the laws about what should be served in a banquet, a Chinese banquet, and in what order that should come. Now, some of these things are pretty strange. Um, not only shark fin, but bear paw, camel hoof, tree pang, bird's nest soup, all these things. But the key thing he said was that shark fin should be served first. And why? Because it's a rare commodity. It shows your guests you have wealth. Now, in, in, when uh, Mao's in power in uh, China, of course, you know, banquets kind of went out of fashion. It might have been a little bit uh, injurious to your health if they actually hold one. But these days, with a burgeoning middle class in China who want to display their wealth, shark fin is a big, big commodity. Now, even in those days, even back in the, uh, in the 17th century, this emperor created an international trade in shark fin. And... When the first explorers came to Australia, people like Flinders and Bodin, they encountered Indonesian fleets in the to around the top of Australia. And these vessels were crewed by up to thousands of men. And they were all engaged in the trade for banquet foods. And their targets were shark fin, beche de mer, and trochas. And they were sailing little vessels like this, much as they are today. Now, in recognition of that centuries-old trade, when, we when Australia declared its, uh, e its uh, exclusive economic zone, the EEZ, in the 70s, the early 70s, um, we recognised that there'd been a long trade in, uh, in Indonesian people coming down to the reefs off northern Australia and, and harvesting those products. So, when we, uh, so we're talking about the area around right through here. And when we declared the EEZ, we made part of that EEZ available to them. And this is a an area called the MOU box, or the Memorandum of Understanding box. And what we said was that Indonesian fishermen could sail down here using traditional methods and, ha and continue their traditional harvest on those reefs. Now, that continues to the present day. You may 
little inset here shows Ashmore Reef, which you're probably familiar with from as its favourite uh, stopping off place for illegal immigrants into Australia. Um, anyway, what does traditional harvesting actually look like? Well, it looks pretty much like this. Um, in cyclone season, pretty much, uh, when the waters are reasonably calm, you sail down into the MOU box and you sail down in these little dugout, virtually a dugout, really, canoe, um, with a group of, you know, six or seven of you, and you use the small dugout here to access the reefs at low tide, where you walk around, reef gleaning, looking for trochus, fish, and more, and you set out long lines. And this is what a shark long line looks like. It's not exactly a sophisticated bit of equipment. It's your polypropylene rope. Oh, mountain, that's easy to do, isn't it? <laughs> it's a bit of polypropylene rope, and in this case, we have fencing wires, traces, these little old bent hooks, and the reef fish you've caught on the way used as bait. Now, despite their apparent um, you know, sort of uh, fairly um, unsophisticated nature, they're actually pretty good at catching sharks, maybe even too good. Here we have um, reef sharks all over drying, the fins drying on the, on the uh, roof of the boat, the deck of the boat. These are largely silver tip sharks, a common reef shark. Um, and uh, there's a little bit of uh, shark fin and flesh drying in this, uh, in this picture too. Now there is some concern. It was concerned by the Australian government, although we let people fish in the MOU box, we're still responsible for managing that area. And we're actually in the mid 2000, we didn't around 2004, 2006, we didn't have much information about how those stocks were doing in that area. And Duha, um, the federal government, were very concerned about the status of, sh of shark stocks in that area because we'd, been sh we'd shown basically pretty much unequivocally that the other types of things they were harvesting, such as the Bechdemir and the Trochus, were in steep decline. So they tasked Ames to actually go out and make a survey um, of the, uh, the reef area for sharks. Now, to do that, to do that, we came up with a pretty standard piece of technology these days. But basically, it's just a handy cam. Put it inside a piece of sewer pipe that's been machined to put Perspex ports on either side. Can you flip the little hand tool off that one? And then you stick it in a frame, a weighted frame. You put a bar out the front, and you put about a kilo of crushed pilchards in that and then you throw it overboard. It sits on the bottom and it attracts basically um, predatory fishes around it, print, uh, but all sorts of reef fishes. It's very, very good way to sample um, fish and predatory fishes in some of these deep water habitats around the 50 to 100 meter mark where you simply can't go diving, but there are lots of sharks. Okay. Now, obviously we can't do a before and after in this situation. What we have to do is use an area where there's very little fishing for sharks and compare that to our, uh, compare that to our MOU box. So here's our MOU box and here's Scott Reef where a lot of our sampling was done. And we compared that to the Rolly Shoals. The Rolly Shoals are about 250 kilometers off Broome. They're one of the last and probably most pristine reef, coral reef areas, atolls, in the Indian Ocean. Virtually no fishing goes on there or has gone on there. It's too far away from Broome for commercial fishermen and it's too far south from Indonesia for the Indonesians to, to get to it. So what did we see when we, saw, when we threw the brubs over at the Rolly Shoals? This is a really nice thing about this technology. You can actually, rather than showing people graphs, you can actually show them what we saw. As, the, as the, uh, the brubs hit the water, hit the ground, we saw a lot of sharks. 11 different species in the Rolly Shoals, and this will just give you an overview, it's a smooth hound shark. This is just one video, right? That's a silver tip shark, a scallop hammerhead shark, and a large female tiger shark. Now the tapes only ran for an hour, and we replicated our deployments, so we had about six or seven of these, and we'd throw them off one after the other, in a space separated by about uh, 400 metres between uh, deployments. And as you can see, when you go to the Rolly Shoals, you see an awful lot of sharks.
grey reef sharks, again scallop hammerhead sharks, more grey reef sharks, tiger sharks. What's quite amazing actually is how many tiger sharks you do see in these deployments. You see one every 40 odd deployments which contrasts, thank goodness, with the number of shark, tiger sharks I see when I go diving on a reef. Okay, just some, some simple data, simple comparisons. On one side we have Mermaid Reef, which is on the, in the Rolly Shoals, and the other side is Scott Reef in the MOU Bay. And we've just taken the mean abundance out of the uh, videos. And for our mean abundance, we have used the maximum number of sharks we saw at any one time during that hour-long video. And the bottom line is that lots of sharks at, uh, at the Rolly Shoals, very, very few at Scott Reef, an order of magnitude less, in fact. And you can use the video in a number of different ways to make that comparison. Here's it's done, it's done in another way. We've got Mermaid Reef, um, a couple of different types of deployments at Mermaid Reef. Uh, again, that's in the Rolly Shoals, so no fishing. And outside at Scott Reef in the MOU box. What we see is that virtually the, the, this is the minutes of video elapsed till we saw a shark. Now, at Mermaid, you throw the thing over and the sharks turn up pretty much instantaneously, or within a few minutes. Whereas at Scott Reef, almost the entire video has elapsed before any sharks turn up at all. Okay, doesn't take too much thought then to, to get to the conclusion that we've got a big difference in diversity between those two locations. Lots of sharks and lots of different species at the Rolly Shoals where there's no fishing for them and very, very few in, uh, in the Scott Reef and the MOU box. And more importantly, the principal sharks that were missing from the MOU box were those sharks that were, pro were really targeted by the Indonesians. Things like hammerheads and silvertip sharks that bear a lot of the shark fin suit material within their fins. They also have very large fins. And the obvious conclusion that we've got going here, although I accept the, fa you know, the fact that, that we don't have a before comparison in this case, is that there's some overfishing going on. Okay, that's the situation in the MOU box. But the Indonesians legally and illegally access many more places along the EEZ than just the, uh, the MOU box. In fact, they access many of these reefs and shoals we see here in this photograph to go fishing. And what we did was we extended those surveys along these reefs and shoals right along this edge. And what did we see? Well effectively exactly the same story. Wherever we went that the Indonesian fishermen had been, we didn't see any sharks. There's a huge problem, or there has been a huge problem, with illegal fishing by Indonesians targeting sharks in these areas. And this is just, uh, I was on a customs vessel, I'll show you some footage in a minute, and w where they actually apprehended one of these fishermen. This is a type three vessel, it's essentially the same vessel you saw before with the mast removed and a, cr a cr pretty rickety old diesel motor stuck inside it so that it can motor down um, across, the, across the EZ. Now, you've got to remember that these guys are doing this in cyclone season. It's a, it's a pretty brave act. And they're finning the sharks, cutting their fins off, throwing the bodies back overboard. The only thing they're after are shark fin. They're doing it in a cycle of around uh, three to four days usually because they're limited by fresh water. They don't carry enough water on board to sustain them much longer than that. Now, can you just run that video? Thanks. Okay, you can see that the people making the profit in the shark fins trade here in the illegal fishing are not these guys. They're, they're doing things in a very primitive way. The only navigation stuff on board is this little old compass, and that's the bilge pump. And when three or four burly Australian custom officers leapt on board, the first thing one of them did was race down the back of the boat and start pumping. <laughs> you saw the long lines there. We've seen them before. It's exactly the same technology. And on board, a really good haul of large shark. And again, incredibly wasteful. The only part of the shark that's kept are the fins. Right, how much, it, how much of a problem is this and how much of a pro and, and will it occur in the future again? Um, let's start off with looking at some customs overflight data. This is data, if, 
anyone working out on a reef is familiar with the Coast Watch flights. Sitting out there, this plane comes over overhead and uh, does a, you know, logs you in the log. Well, they do that with the foreign fishing, the illegal fishermen across the northern part of Australia. And what I've got here is the data for those shark fin boats over a spread of about five years. Now, this is cumulative data, so it's every sighting they saw in that particular year. And here's our MOU box back down here again to just refresh your memory as to where we are going up here. So let's have a look how this evolves over time. 2002, not too bad. 2003, we're starting to get a few. We're getting more. We're getting a lot more. We're getting a whole lot more. Okay, this is 2005, mind you, to April 2006. And that's the peak of the, uh, of the illegal incursions. At this point, we're getting um, illegal fishermen sighted off the Rolly Shoals. We're getting um, Aboriginal um, landholders ringing up um, people in the police in the Northern Territory to complain about the Indonesian fishermen who are up three kilometres up their river. We're getting, uh, we're, we're getting um, Brute Island described by these guys as Lamp Island because of the lights off it at night. They're using it for navigating around the Gulf. Um, we're, you know, it's, it's a fairly serious problem and it's starting to leak down onto the Great Barrier Reef as well. Okay, the funny thing is, it's pretty much stopped. It's not like that anymore. Now, I'll go back a second, and what I'll just draw your attention to is I run it backwards, you can see the pattern. See, watch how they drift all the illegal fishing, starts at the top and moves down in a wave. Okay, I'll come back to that point in a second. The shark fishing has recently declined. Why? Well, I think there's three reasons. One, Australia spent close to half a billion dollars, $500 million on more enforcement. They, they chartered vessels from overseas. They employed a lot more people. They built ships. Um, at its height, they were seeing 4,000 vessels in a year, 22 a day. Um, some of their lauded operations, such as Operation Clearwater, which they declared a big success, um, arrested 22 vessels in, a, in the entire operation. So, yes, I think enforcement has had, a, has had an effect. There is a much greater chance that many of those fishermen are going to be caught. Their boats are sunk or destroyed, uh, burnt, and the fishermen are either flown straight back to Indonesia or the captains are incarcerated. So I think the better enforcement and policing of the area has slowed it. But there's two other things I think have probably had an even bigger effect. One of those is the increasing price of gas. I think it's, these guys aren't making much money out of this and it's becoming rapidly less and less economic for them to make those big excursions right down to the Australian coastline. The second thing is that I think we've, we've got rid of the problem to some respects by reacting so slowly to it that the Indonesians have largely cleaned out most of the sharks. I think we've got rid of our problem by giving them the fish. Um, if you interview the Indonesian fishermen in the lockups in Brisbane, which I've done, and you ask them, why are you risking your lives in these little leaky vessels to travel all the way down in cyclone season into Australian waters? Why aren't you throwing these lines out in your own waters? And I think this is the answer to that question. Most of them say they'd like to, but A, it's very, very difficult. Here we are in the Arafura Sea, so just off the top, there's our EEZ finishing there. And these are the illegal fishing sightings from a radar sat just in three or four months. And we're not talking dugouts here. We're talking giant pear trawlers, factory ships. The illegal fishing problem that's going on in Indonesia and is driving these fishermen into Australian waters makes our problem pale by comparison. Okay, illegal fishing, therefore, in Australia is part of a regional process. It's part of a longer-term process that involves a cascade of events, and we just happen to be at the end of that cascade. We ignore it at our peril. Can it happen again? Absolutely. What will happen is there will be a fishing down the food chain. The sharks may have gone, but the next item on that list may be the snappers or some other 
to, um, item of, of value. And a classic, it, it's classic, we'll, they will fish down the food chain and as climate change and population pressures increase and their own oceans are scoured clean, Australia is the next target. We discussed some of those issues in this recent paper in Fish and Fisheries, if you want to have a little bit look, uh, more detailed look at the arguments. Um, ongoing work, well, at the moment we're aiming to try, try to resurvey the MOU box early next year, looking at recovery. And some of those reefs are now actually being protected for a little while. So we want to see if we can actually trace some sort of bounce back in shark stocks. We're tracking habitat use and movement patterns at Ningaloo, the Rolly Shoals, Palau, a bunch, of, a bunch of different places around the Pacific, and we're very interested in the ecosystem effects of shark removal. Because in many ways, what we're doing would be essentially like wandering out onto the plains of the Serengeti, just like Ernest Hemingway did, with a big gun and shooting all the lions. In coral reef ecosystems, we have very little idea what, that eff what effect that actually has on our ecosystem. I suspect, however, it won't be something we like. Um, acknowledgements. I'd like to acknowledge those people, particularly Mike Capo, and uh, thanks very much. <laughs>